for my talk today, I'd like to um, focus on the Chinese economic outlook. And many of you are going to, uh, uh, after hearing uh, Dr. Fain's uh, comments, you realize how closely related these two economies are. And but you know, before I arrive in Australia. Uh, I have to learn. I don't know much about it. And so I'm going to uh, uh, say something that may be quite obvious uh, to you all. And uh, so I'd like to look at sort of how this relationship formed uh, over the years and, uh, and you know, sort of the current state and where it's going. And of course, in the middle of this, importantly, is the Chinese uh, economic outlook. Okay. Um, so first of all, let me take a look at China during the early years of economic reform, uh, which uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping talked about, uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, liberal, uh, liberalism, right? And so here you see this, uh, uh, when China started uh, opening up, uh, China had uh, very little to offer to the world. And uh, while Australia kind of doing the same thing, but Australia, for Australia, this is natural, uh, but not for China. China need all those natural resources. Uh, it need the food, it need the pork, but it's exporting them, not because uh, it makes money for them, but it's because it's necessary. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, when China is doing this, it's out of necessity. Um, so you know, China is exporting uh, petroleum, and obviously uh, there's something wrong in that picture, uh, clearly. Um, and China should be importing, and, uh, as they do today. And China obviously do a lot of other things, uh, which uh, today China would not be exporting, but would be the importer of all this. Um, so Australia it seems like the big competitor of China at the time. So China was competing against Australia in trying to sell uh, commodities and uh, agricultural products, and in particular proteins. And when China, in fact, should have more protein, and uh, uh, but, so that's when China's clearly very poor and uh, didn't have much to offer to the world. And then we quickly forward to 2017, right? So almost uh, 40 years later, uh, China began to look more of a normal country, right? Uh, more normal in the sense that it's a country with, lots of po with a lot of population, with more than 10 billion people to start with in 1980, and, and it has 1.3 billion people. Uh, in 2017. When you have lots of people, then you need the people to be employed, and you can't have those people employed on farms. Uh, you have those people employed in factories. So China became uh, literally the factory of the world, right? Um, and today's making uh, broadcasting equipment, including Huawei's exports, computers, uh, it's still making uh, textiles, which is uh, an important part of the uh, staple. And it's, uh, uh, from here, you can see that China is no longer importing petroleum, or, or, or I'm sorry, exporting petroleum or uh, iron ore or any of those things. And in fact, China is a big importer of that. And so uh, it's very complementary, as uh, Dr. Fain uh, just said a few minutes ago. And Australia is exporting iron ore and uh, coal, and the big recipient uh, is China. And so China obviously became a factory of the world thanks to, a lot to uh, Australian uh, commodities, which literally allowed China to urbanize, which built uh, uh, infrastructure in China. And of course, uh, uh, Australia also exported lots of protein to China, and hopefully that built the spine of the Chinese people. So that's part of the whole thing that uh, and uh, contributed to all this uh, uh, economic uh, integration, you might say, this complementarity between these two countries. Um, and, and I realize there are a lot more relationship going on than trade, but trade is a very uh, useful tool for us to look into that. So as a result, and let's see what happens, right? As a result of China's rise uh, from a poor country into the world factory, Australia really enjoyed uh, more than 30, almost 30 years of prosperity, right? The last recession Australia experienced was in the 19, early 1990s, I believe 1990 and 1991. 
And, uh, um, and after that, and, uh, Australia has not had a recession. In fact, Australia has enjoyed tremendously uh, from these improving uh, terms of trade. Uh, uh, for audience who uh, you know, don't know this term, and I'm an economist, I'd like to talk about prices, uh, even though I may not know the value behind them. Uh, the prices here are basically export prices divided by import prices. So when, when we see an improving terms of trade, that means Australians are exporting goods and services that are increasingly highly valued. And they are importing goods and services that are increasingly falling in prices, right? So this is a, a clearly when you are you know, selling things that are rising and buying things that are depreciating in prices, you gain. Uh, so Australia uh, has been doing very well uh, with this uh, rapidly improving terms of trade. Uh, and I think that China contributed a lot and to these improvements in the Australian terms of trade. Which you, you know, when you look at the Chinese terms of trade, you see the reverse, right? China used to enjoy a rising terms of trade, but since 2000, uh, since roughly about 2000, and China has having deteriorating terms of trade, which is really, uh, uh, but it's not too bad. I mean, it's uh, so we're, the Chinese are not complaining. All right. Um, but the Australia is, is doing very, really well in this relationship. Um, and uh, so now uh, let's talk about the current state. Uh, since about 2012, China entered the new norm, and, and so does the Australian terms of trade. So the new norm is that the Chinese economy, the growth rate in the Chinese economy has moderated and uh, and as a result, we can see that the uh, Australian terms of trade uh, has been declining. And the, really, the bottom is reached uh, around the beginning of 2016. Really coincides very well with our data. Um, so let me show you our data. Um, here's our data uh, collected from our alumni and students. Right? This is a, a very interesting uh, data that we, uh, we do. Part of the reason it's interesting is that it is a survey of private businesses in China. It's different from the National Statistical Bureau's uh, surveys, and this is primarily concentrated on uh, CKGSBs, uh, alumni, and students, and who are mostly medium and small size businesses in China. And they are the, really the fastest growing and the most important uh, uh, part of the Chinese economy. And I would say they are the leading, leading indicator of China, right? And we see these, uh, you know, there are a lot of fluctuations, and uh, if I smooth it out, you can see these, uh, these index go to roughly the bottom around the beginning of 2016, and it's really coincided with uh, deteriorating uh, terms of trade in the uh, uh, in Australian economy. Uh, so as the Chinese economy going through uh, these uh, new norm uh, and these relations with uh, Australia is also showing very uh, strongly, highly highlights the uh, complementarity between the two countries. As China improved in growth prospect, uh, we show in the data uh, post uh, 2016, uh, you can see uh, Australian uh, uh, terms of trade improving. And what's really important is the last year in 2018, Chinese private businesses experienced a, a very large shock, a negative shock. And uh, thanks to the Chinese infrastructure investment, we, don't, we didn't see a lot of uh, fluctuations in the Australian terms of trade. Uh, but uh, as Chinese government uh, started uh, doing very strong stimulus plans, to stimulate the economy, we can see the Chinese uh, private businesses rebounding very nicely. And so uh, that also is indication of the, uh, we, we see current improvement and also we see future improvement in the, in, in the Australian terms of trade, uh, as you see in this, in this chart. So the, uh, the data not only shows that uh, we, we, the sales and profits, What's really important, as you can see here, is how the Chinese entrepreneurs see the future. And uh, this is an index of their hiring and investment. 
and the hiring investment also reached the bottom of the, and the, uh, right, right around the beginning of 2016, it has rebounded nicely. But 2018, we see a sharp reduction, again, a rebound because of the Chinese policy response and to these uh, decline. And it's, uh, this response is quite strong, as you can see, it's a large V-shaped uh, uh, sort of a rebound and from the uh, uh, previous lows. Um, and how do we know this is a Chinese government policy? Well, if you look at the uh, uh, important uh, thing here, the blue line, which we show, this is the uh, financing conditions uh, that our private businesses face, right? Uh, many of our own uh, alumni and, and small firms and private firms in China, uh, they rely a lot on the credits uh, for their expansion. And when the Chinese uh, financial system is uh, not necessarily uh, discriminating against the Chinese private business, but because the uh, private business is more risky, and as long as you uh, have state-owned firms uh, as a benchmark, and uh, the credits are more likely to go to private, to, to go to uh, the state-owned state -owned sector rather than the private sector. Uh, but 2018, we see a rapid deteriorating of financing conditions into the private business. Uh, and then, of course, uh, beginning in November 1st, the Chinese government realized uh, what's going on, right? So the uh, President Xi Jinping made an effort, right? And he had personally held a meeting and asked for uh, uh, change in policy. And the change in policy came swiftly, as you can see, this large, this huge, uh, V-shaped rebound in financing conditions that private firms face. Um, so we, uh, by looking at these, you can uh, understand uh, the reasons why the recent economic uh, statistics is improving in China. Uh, so as again, this shows that our uh, uh, index is really the leading, leading indicator. We lead the uh, uh, National Bureau of Statistics uh, indicators by roughly two months. Uh, so this is very significant. Um, and uh, uh, combining sales, profits, financing conditions, and inventory conditions, we get these data. Uh, so this is the, the, our aggregate data. And the last thing I want to show is that the Chinese data do show some sign that uh, we need to pay attention to, in particular for our partners uh, in Australia. One thing is that the Chinese economy is going through what we call a, the new norm. And the new norm is not just a term, and is actually importantly referred to the fact that Chinese companies, Chinese economy has been experiencing a rapid increase in costs. And the reason that China is, has been able to be the world factory is because uh, it is, uh, its cost is lowest in the world and is no longer lowest in the world. And one has to justify the reason why these manufacturing, these activities has to be done in China. Uh, and, and you can see this rapid increase in costs, both labor as well as uh, total costs in China. And, uh, but n the nice things going on right now is the Chinese government also realized this long-term trend and is doing, uh, policies that are aimed at reducing costs in doing business in China. As you can see, the uh, moderation in the increase in the costs, and this has to do with the government effort to cut taxes, and so on and so forth. And I won't go into details about this. Um, one of the things um, and we can see is that uh, the reason that our indicators are very much of a leading, leading indicator is because our firms are one of the most competitive uh, in the same sector uh, in, in China, in, you know, whether you are in, many, you know, in any particular uh, subsector of manufacturing or in services sector. Uh, this is uh, the CQGSB alumni is always the, uh, I would say, the leading companies in each individual sector, and so they're, they're doing very well. Now, so going forward, uh, we do see uh, Chinese economy uh, coming out of the current uh, uh, low points and going uh, to have more moderate 
uh, growth rate, and uh, the growth rate will not be as high as in the past, you know, above 8%, but it will be, uh, as we see in, in our uh, data, I think 6% for the coming year uh, is uh, highly achievable, and I think that should uh, bode well for the Australian economy as well as Australian currency. And I think uh, many of our students are complaining that uh, Australian dollars are falling. And of course, you know, to us it's great, right? Um, uh, uh, but to Australian uh, uh, friends, it may not be, right? So, but you know, it may be good depending on you know, where you sit. Um, but that's uh, uh, something had to do with the uh, terms of trade improving in, uh, in Australia, which we think is uh, likely to show up in the data uh, in the near future. Thank you.